Engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Fear not, I have returned. Welcome, it is Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. Apparently, the name of the station hasn't changed while I was gone. The phone number, 404-872-0750, wsb talk I am delighted to be back with you after a restful vacation where I did not get eaten by alligators in Hilton Head. Now, we have a huge news situation on our southern border that isn't getting the attention it deserves. That's why I'm here to tell you all the things you need to know that no one else seems to want to tell you. There is a massive a convoy of supposed refugees headed our way through Mexico. Uh, 1,200 Central Americans. It is a caravan being organized by a group called People Without Borders. It is their goal to overwhelm American border agents at various entry points along the California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas borders to try to gain entry into the country claiming to be asylum seekers. The problem here is that if any of these people are allowed into the country as asylum seekers, uh, a lot of liberal judges will have a lot of leeway in letting them go into various states and in those states um, essentially claim to be asylum seekers, go through hearings and have demands on the state to take care of them until they can be dispatched back to where they came. The Mexican government is allowing these people to go through Mexico headed our way. The president is calling on Mexico to do something about it, but Mexico has no interest in doing anything. And the reason is because there are 1,200 people in a mob. And the Mexicans aren't just going to gun them down. But here's the other thing. This is why it's so important. I don't think people in this country realize Mexico is in the midst of a bloody civil war. It is genuinely a country coming apart. Regions and cities within Mexico have taken the law into their own hands. They're establishing their own governments Uh, apart from the Mexican government. There's so much distrust of the of the military and the, the national police in Mexico. There's distrust of the president in Mexico. There's massive amounts of corruption. The drug cartels are waging a very effective war, as are various other gangs all fighting each other. The country is breaking apart. Mexico does not have the manpower or ability to stop a caravan of 1,200 Hondurans, Nicaraguans, Ecuadorians, Guatemalans, and the like headed into the United States. This is going to be on President Trump and his administration, and they need to figure out a way to shut this situation down. It is impacting his decisions on DACA. Now, For those who are freaking out about DACA, here's something you need to understand. According to the president's own plan, you would have to have been in this country by 2007 in order to qualify for DACA. Be in by 2007, have applied by 2014. So none of these people would qualify for DACA. Now, you can say, well, they could get fraudulent documents, whatnot. If they get into this country as asylum seekers, they're going to be documented and fingerprinted because of policies put in place by this president. So it's going to be real hard for them to get fake documents if they come across the border because they will have been fingerprinted at the border and documented as they come in as so-called asylum seekers. So they would fall outside the DACA parameters. parameters. They would not qualify. Of course, the Democrats can say, open it, open it, open it. Uh, But even the Democrats had agreed that that this class of people shouldn't. Oh, whether they keep their word or not is another story. Yet the Democrats will never keep their word. But the DACA situation that the president raised yesterday isn't the biggest issue. The big issue is that this is an intentional effort by a group of people called People Without Borders who do not respect the territorial sovereignty of the United States. It is coming this way, and very few news outlets are talking about it. They're too busy screaming about Sinclair Broadcasting. So all of the media that should be bringing you the latest on this convoy of people coming up to the United States trying to overwhelm our borders are fixated on Sinclair Broadcasting. Let me read you the script of the Sinclair Broadcasting um, promo that they're having their anchors read. They're having their two anchors read it. In some cases, three are doing it, but it's supposed to be for two. Hi, I'm A and I'm B. Our greatest responsibility is to serve our Atlanta community. 
We are extremely proud of the quality balanced journalism that whatever station they had here in Atlanta produces. But we're concerned about the troubling trend of irresponsible one-sided news stories plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories, stories that aren't just true or, or just aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media using their platform to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. This is extremely dangerous to a democracy. At our station, it's our responsibility to pursue and report the truth. We understand truth is neither politically left nor right. Our commitment to factual reporting is the foundation of our credibility now more than ever. Do, do you get this? At our station, it's our responsibility to pursue and report the truth. We understand truth is neither politically left nor right. Our commitment to factual reporting is the foundation of our credibility now more than ever. Well, Sinclair had all of their TV stations do this, and um, a left-wing group put together a spooky um, mock-up or, or a spooky demonstration of this by running them all. Let me play you a sample of this uh, from the audio. Let me route this right. Here. I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso, Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about trying to get responsible, one-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all too common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming. It sounds deeply demented and disturbing when you see it produced this way as they've taken every little Sinclair station around the country, uh, 200 of them, right-leaning local stations, they're calling them, and they're putting them together, uh, showing, oh, they're all doing this. This is so top-down. How dare they? Sinclair likes Trump. This is bad. Now, the, all these people were celebrating the Washington Post going with democracy dies in the, in the dark. But they're outraged that Sinclair Broadcasting would say we understand truth is neither politically left nor right. Here's what's really going on here. Yes, there are some concerns about Sinclair and its supposed Trump biases. Donald Trump, you will recall, uh, Jared Kushner bragged that they had a deal with um, Sinclair Broadcasting for fair coverage, which was interpreted to mean um, biased coverage in his favor. But that's not really what this is about. What this is about is Sinclair is about to purchase a number of television stations around the country. And these media outlets are looking at this and they see a competitor growing on the landscape, on the horizon. And they're buying Tribune Media's TV stations around the country. And so these media reporters at CNN and elsewhere that are perfectly happy with biased coverage on the left are outraged because they're already having their lunch money stolen by Fox. And so now they're worried that another conservative outlet is growing on the scene. And this one will be local coverage. You see, here's the thing. Uh, some of the money that some of these outlets get, um, CNN being a good example here, is CNN allows local stations to use its national news reporting. Well, Sinclair would be cutting into CNN's bottom line if it started producing its own national coverage. So... All of this outrage, and it is being led by CNN, by the way, all of this outrage has everything to do with a business decision. They're trying to scare the FCC into denying Sinclair Broadcasting's right to purchase Tribune Media's TV stations because they don't want another conservative news outlet on the horizon. They don't want another conservative news outlet because they're already being beaten by Fox. Oh my gosh, what if we have two of these conservative outlets stealing the rest of our shows, the rest of our audience? That's what all of this is about. It has nothing to do with the content of that promo. And it is a promo. It wasn't even an editorial. It was a promo for their station saying that the truth is neither left nor right and hold us accountable if we don't get it right. That's what they said. That's what they said. It was designed in a spooky way that YouTube video produced. It was produced in a way to make it look very creepy. But local Stations around the country that are parts of these big conglomerates, Tribune, Gannett, 
Sinclair, they've been doing this sort of stuff about news broadcasts forever. Nothing has changed except these people are conservative. So outrage. Let me take a quick time out for a sponsor, which came in really handy for me this week. Text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 303030. That's 303030 or 303030. Text Eric there now to let the magic happen. I'm talking about Beachbody On Demand. Now, you're probably not aware of Beachbody On Demand per se, but you know some of their programs, P90X, Insanity, 21 Day Fix, the three-week yoga retreat. Okay, retweet, retreat, if I can talk. Okay, let me get serious here for a minute. Last week, I had a pinched nerve in my foot, which I'd never had before. It was the worst pain. Now, I admit I don't have high pain tolerance, but I've had surgeries, whatnot. This hurt worse than anything. I thought I'd broken my foot. It was swollen and red to begin with. Uh, the, the pain went away, but, or the, the swelling went away, but the pain didn't, I could not walk on my foot at all. And I had to go to Los Angeles and I'd been using the beach body on demand product on my Apple TV with their yoga program, particularly the stretching and in California on my iPad was still able to get it. And it actually was a handy stretching program, um, uh, really helped a lot with my calf muscle from limping and everything as, as the pinch was working its way out, the medicine was doing its job, uh, really actually used this program while I was in LA, uh, came in handy. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on a tablet. You can get it on a TV. Really excellent to be able to watch on demand exercises. You don't have to worry about DVDs and stuff. I do highly recommend their yoga package, which I've been using just for flexibility and the stretching came in super handy while traveling with my foot problem. Give it a try. My listeners are going to get a free trial membership when you text Eric to 303030. You're going to get full access to the entire platform for free. All the workouts and nutrition information free. All you've got to do is text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 303030. Go do it right now. Text Eric to 303030. And thank you to Beach Body On Demand for sponsoring the show. So... I assume you guys are aware of the Atlanta City hacking ongoing. A a real life, real world uh, situation is I have a relative who was in a car wreck two weeks ago. She was in the left lane on I-20 headed into the city. Someone came across the interstate, sideswiped her, ran her into the retaining wall, dividing the east and westbound I-20 lanes and drove off. Um... She was so banged up and and everything, didn't get the license plate of the person who drove off, and her car has been impounded. So um, her family can't get the car out of the impound lot. Apparently, no police in Atlanta have typewriters. They've got to have a letter to get into the lot, and then they have to have cash because they can't take a credit card at the impound lot right now because of the hacking. And the insurance agent didn't want to use his own cash to do it, but they couldn't get into the lot. They couldn't get the letter from the police. Because apparently no one knows how to use a typewriter anymore. Everything is on the computer. You know, it, it may seem a little old school, but it seems like the, the city of Atlanta could be breaking out the typewriters right now for stuff. Um, typing on a typewriter and then saving what's called paper in a thing called an inbox. And when the computers come back and are no longer hacked, take those pieces of paper and then do what's called data entry and put them into the computer record. But they have the, the, the real world example of how this is being how Atlanta is just screwed up. And it, I mean, total incompetence. Listen, it's not the mayor's fault. Uh, Keisha Lansbottom is not to blame for this. She may be to blame by the reaction to it in the city and the delays and, and not breaking out typewriters. But the, it's, the hacking is not her fault. Um, it, it happened to Boeing. Uh, these are these are super, super sharp hackers, and we need better IT people. And, I mean, I don't want to insult IT people, but uh, we need better ones. It's 39 after the hour. I am Eric Erickson, returned from vacation. The phone number 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. We must return to episode one, The Phantom Menace. A trade blockade in place by Newt Gorin. You know, this was the, the moment I realized... 
that George Lucas really was a garbage director and a garbage uh, producer. Uh, this was during the the height of the the so called uh, Republican Revolution, Gingrich in charge, and the bad guy's name just so happened to be Newt. Yeah, no coincidence there. Um, terrible movie, by the way. Uh, George Lucas, a uh, terrible, terrible director. Um, should have just left him in the editing room. Uh, and then he destroyed my childhood. You know, the, it is proof that time travel is impossible because someone would have gone back in time, probably after Return of the Jedi, and, and just uh, taken him out uh, to spare us the first three episodes. And now we got to do it with Ryan Johnson because every time I watch The Last Jedi, it just makes me even more aggravated. But I digress. The trade war is happening. China imposing immediate tariffs on imports of American pork, which is huge. It's going to hurt. Georgia, actually, uh, the Georgia farm community is going to be devastated by the tariffs being imposed uh, in China on American agricultural foodstuffs. Um, the Europeans are just giddy over this. The American uh, stock market has tanked today because of it. This is a trade war we are getting into. China is responding and the president's uh, response is to impose even more tariffs on China. So your costs are going to go up. Sales are going to go down of American products in the largest market outside the United States. Uh, Mexican tariffs as well are being imposed. Uh, now, um, the president kind of walked that that back. He said at first Canada and Mexico could get some waivers, and now waivers for Mexico aren't being given after all. So we're going to have a trade war there, the trade war with uh, China ongoing. Uh, pork products going to be um, a, see a tariff. A corn products going to see a tariff. Other agricultural imports into China, uh, exports to China, going to see tariffs. Um, this is going to be a trade war. You are going to be the loser. Tariffs do not work. Tariffs are a bad idea. And I know it makes some of you feel good in, in the Trump community that the president has taken on these other countries by imposing tariffs. All he's done is hurt American manufacturers and American farmers and American consumers who are going to face higher prices. It's the same with Amazon. Why in God's name is the president taking on Amazon, which is an American success story, other than he's upset with Washington Post coverage and Jeff Bezos owns it? I mean, I, I realize some of you actually believe that the post office has given Amazon such a sweetheart deal that they're losing money, but that's actually not true. I mean, this is one of those things that goes back to the Sinclair broadcasting situation where facts are neither left nor right. It is a fact that the post office is prohibited by law from undercutting the market. It is a fact that the post office by law cannot lose money in a contract. It is not allowed to enter into a contract where it loses money. The post office is actually making money off Amazon. The post office has supplemented its revenue stream off of Amazon. The post office is now doing Sunday deliveries because it is determined it is profitable to do so. It is making money on Sundays for the first time in American history. You may not like it. You may think Amazon is getting too much of a sweetheart deal. But what you may not realize is that Amazon, they weren't just paying uh, the post office to deliver packages. Amazon also paid to offset upgrades for the post office for its shipping and tracking and computer systems and, and delivery tracking monitors and all that. So part of the cost of Amazon wasn't the cost of shipping packages. It was also the cost of buying all of the equipment and setting it up for the post office because the post office was too incompetent to do it. So the post office isn't losing money. It, it's it's a fair deal. It's just kind of silly. Um, the outrage over this, the outrage by the president, who's only upset with Amazon because he doesn't like Jeff Bezos. Amazon is an American success story. I get everything I can from Amazon because I don't like people. I don't want to go to the grocery store and interact with people. They give me the flu. So nonetheless, by the way, I mean, this is... Kind of old news, except it's not old news because we have the final totals in. 25 million viewers and a 7.3 rating among adults 18 to 49 for Roseanne. The first night's episode. Now, now, why that flux? Um, here's what you need to understand about that flux. Um, the reason that, and that, by the way, that doesn't include 4.3 million viewers who tuned in for an encore presentation of it. 
Um, the reason that this sh- uh, shifted and went up in the ratings is because it takes some time for the ratings reviewers and the TV companies and whatnot to assess people who time delayed uh, their watching of Roseanne. If they had it on, for example, a TiVo, they recorded it and they watched it later, things like that. They have to take all of that into account. Um, and once you take all that into account and it takes a week to do that because you're trying to, to give people time before the next TV show comes on to figure it out. It looks like Roseanne's ratings have gone up to a, a, a 20, what is it? 20 million, 25 million viewers and a 7.3 rating. That's actually pretty phenomenal for that show. And I didn't watch it. I want nothing to do with this Roseanne reboot. And the reason I don't want anything to do with this Roseanne reboot is because this isn't really really a conservative she she's not a conservative and they're trying to parody what they believe trump voters are which are social liberals who are blue collar economic conservatives that's it that's the only reason um that this show is on you've got a a cross-dressing grandkid and and i mean they're perfectly happy as long as uh, social liberalism is on display they can say they're Trump voters, and they're only Trump voters because they're on hard times and they've made bad life decisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're peri- uh, parroting Trump voters with Roseanne. And you may like the show. That's fine. Uh, go for it. I, I, I want nothing to do with it because Hollywood is selling you a lie yet again with Roseanne, who herself is not a conservative. I mean, she's a wackadoo conspiracy theorist a leftist and always has been and always will be, even if she's making kissy face with you, with you right now because she wants you to watch her show. It is 50. 50- Fifty-five after the hour. Let's go to the phones here. Mike, welcome. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Hey, I just wanted to make a comment. You were talking about the Roseanne show. Yeah. you got to remember, Norman Lear created Archie to make conservatives look in a bad light. Yep. Maybe they're making the same mistake again. Oh, I, I think there's something to that. And you know what's so funny, though, is that um, it, it's making the media think, hey, maybe we should reboot the, or restart the Tim Allen show. Or, it, there's a report out of ABC News today that a lot of ABC staffers feel very uncomfortable that they're catering to uh-huh. Trump voters. Uh, of course they do. Um, I, I just look, I, I, the media is going to latch onto this and say, oh, ratings bonanza, let's make shows for Trump voters. But I think actually what's going to happen is they're going to make a bunch of shows that are really subtly ridiculing Trump voters. I mean, when's the last time Hollywood has made a TV show about an authentically Christian family? There's apparently one, but after the first season, they stopped going to church. I don't I, I don't think that Hollywood has it in. And, you know, I, I've got some friends of mine who think that Hollywood's all about the money. They see this is going to work. They're, they're seeing ratings. And I just I won't hold my breath. Look at what HBO and Netflix are doing. They're continuing to make shows catering to liberal audiences. They're not making shows catering to conservatives. They're, I mean, you, you've got David Letterman interviewing a, a host of left-wing activists and the former president and uh, Hollywood actors and whatnot. They've, you now have got these left-wing guys with this podcast, Pod Saves America. They're teaming up with HBO to do a, a left-wing series. Uh, Hollywood, by and large, doesn't understand conservatives and doesn't know how to market to conservatives. It wouldn't know them if they bit them in the backside. Uh, which isn't surprising to me, but is deeply frustrating. And I got to tell you, I'm one of those people, I don't care what your politics are. If I like you, I, I love Pearl Jam and it, Eddie Vedder's a huge leftist. Uh, your politics don't bother me, but parodying and ridiculing conservatives does. Hello there, it's 9 after the hour. I'm Eric Erickson. Remember me? The phone number, 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. Now, I'm going to start the show because I was getting to this very topic. I'm going to start with Kim and John's Creek. Kim, welcome. Hi there, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to call up and congratulate you. Uh, last year, when all the leaks were just coming out of the White House, like 
of, you know, like the Trevi Fountain. Um, I remember you saying that from your sources and just from what you knew that you thought that the leaker was Hope Hicks. And, um, and I can't, uh, the name escapes me right now, but a book just came out Mm -hmm. and it named Hope Hicks as the primary White House leaker. And I immediately thought of you and I just wanted to call you up and congratulate you and give you a pat (laughs) on the back. Well, thank you. And, 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 you know, so there are two out and, and one of the books is naming Hope Hicks. Uh, and essentially it's a lament that now that she's gone, uh, leaking will be down at the White House. There's another book out, though, that's naming Kellyanne Conway as the primary leaker. Yes, and I saw it's that too. amazing to see, uh, the number of reporters who have actually come out and said, uh, you know, we can just say up front that this isn't true. They're not saying that about Hope Hicks because it was true about Hope. And th- that leads me to this. While I was on vacation last week, Kim, thanks very much for your phone call. While I was on vacation last week, a new story came out about George Conway. George Conway is Kellyanne Conway's husband. And he had the audacity to retweet on Twitter, social media, links to some newspaper articles that were critical of the president. And these news stories were coming out saying, oh, can can you believe that George George Conway would tweet these negative things about the president? That's Kellyanne Conway says, she must agree with him. Now, can you imagine the calls of the calls of sexism? If the premise was that a wife was retweeting these things and it must be indicative of her agreeing with her husband. But I mean, that's essentially what George Conway was. George Conway was was agreeing with his wife. His wife must have these beliefs. If the role was reversed, there would be all sorts of screams of sexism. George Conway is a private citizen. Ninety nine percent of you have never heard of until I just started talking about him. And he retweeted some stories that were critical of the president. He retweeted some that were favorable of the president as well. They didn't focus on those. They focused on all the ones that were critical. And it was a huge story. And then it comes out with this book this week that is making the rounds all over the media that Kellyanne Conway is the number one prime leaker in the White House. I have to tell you that I know Kellyanne Conway very well. And she is not in the top 10 leakers at the White House. In fact, you know who the number one leaker at the White House is now that Hope Hicks is gone? I I can tell you who the number one leaker is at the White House. I know. I I know for a fact. I have never had this person leak to me. But I know who the number one leaker at the White House is. Because I've talked to several of the major prominent reporters who appear on your TV screen on a daily basis. And they have told me. And these weren't off-the-record conversations. These were bar chats. I can tell you who the biggest leaker at the White House is, and I will name that person. The president is the biggest leaker in the White House. The president calls reporters at night from the private residence at the White House and chats with them, including some of the reporters he attacks on Twitter. And it is a transactional relationship. He shoots the breeze with them, and and they write stuff up, and then he can attack them and deny it. And they're not going to attack the president and say, well, you're the one who gave it to me. Because this is a transactional relationship. The president wants to get this information out there. He wants to brag about himself. The reporters, uh, they want to write about it. They want the scoop, but the president has to deny it. This happens routinely. It's been going on since before he got into the White House. The president is the biggest leaker. In the top 10, though, Kellyanne Conway is not it. But here's the thing. With Hope Hicks out of the way, the director of communications job is open. And I do not think it is a coincidence at all. In fact, I know for a fact it is not a coincidence. That this hit piece on George Conway came out last week in the run-up to a book coming out today claiming uh, Kellyanne Conway's the biggest leaker. This is all about trying to sabotage the one conservative who li- the president listens to among his staff so that she does not get the communications job. I don't even know if she's up for it, but it is pretty clear to me that someone in the White House is trying to sabotage Kellyanne Conway and keep her from becoming uh, the communications director of the White House. Someone is leaking negatively about her and George, her husband, in order to stop this from happening, in order to undermine the president's trust in her. Kellyanne Conway is a committed, decent, wonderful person, a friend of mine, and a good conservative. And 
somebody wants to stop her from having the president's ear. And I suspect it is a Kushner. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect so. Listen, Kellyanne Conway and Mike Pence are both reliable conservatives. They are reliably conservative and have the pulse of the conservative movement. And what we have seen over the last year is a number of people trying to get the president to stop listening to conservatives and listen to Goldman Sachs, listen to liberals, listen to certain people in Hollywood that they want the president to listen. And every time the president does, he gets in trouble. But these people have their own interests in mind. They don't have the president's interests in mind. Kellyanne Conway does. Mike Pence does. Mike Pence's future is tied to Donald Trump's success. And so these people are trying to limit their access to him in the White House. This is the way it always happens. But the Game of Thrones within the White House is far nastier than other administrations. And the reason it is far nastier is because President Trump really doesn't have uh, the depth, nor does he want the depth on particular policy issues that his predecessors have had. And he relies on the the well-formed opinions of the people he surrounds himself with to help him make up his mind as opposed to delving into it on his own. So he listens to all these people. He takes in their information. He processes it and he makes up his mind. And if you limit the number of conservatives who are in that circle of advisors who the president talks to, well, then you more and more guarantee that the outcome is going to be one on the left. And that's the problem. And that's why they're out to get Kellyanne Conway. This whole White House story about her being a leaker is designed around that. Going after her husband is designed around that. And the more that can be exposed, the better. But going back to Kim, the caller, yeah, I don't think there's any question uh, that Hope Hicks was a regular leaker. And you know how you could tell that Hope Hicks was a regular leaker in the White House? Here's here's a little way. Uh, If you take all the reporters who are writing stories about the White House— They name-check lots of people. Who was the person who least got name-checked? That tends to be the source. And that always tended to be Hope Hicks until towards the end as she was on her way out, which was a big red flag that she probably was one of the leakers. Let me take a quick time out for a sponsor, which came in really handy for me this week. Text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 303030. That's 303030 or 303030. Text Eric there now to let the magic happen. I'm talking about Beachbody On Demand. Now, you're probably not aware of Beachbody On Demand per se, but you know some of their programs, P90X, Insanity, 21 Day Fix, the three-week yoga retreat. Okay, retweet, retreat, if I can talk. Okay, let me get serious here for a minute. Last week, I had a pinched nerve in my foot, which I'd never had before. It was the worst pain. Now, I admit I don't have high pain tolerance, but I've had surgeries, whatnot. This hurt worse than anything. I thought I'd broken my foot. It was swollen and red to begin with. Uh, the, the pain went away, but, or the, the swelling went away, but the pain didn't, I could not walk on my foot at all. And I had to go to Los Angeles and I'd been using the beach body on demand product on my Apple TV with their yoga program, particularly the stretching and in California on my iPad was still able to get it. And it actually was a handy stretching program. Um, uh, really helped a lot with my calf muscle from limping and everything as, as the pinch was working its way out, the medicine was doing its job, uh, really actually used this program while I was in LA, uh, came in handy. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on a tablet. You can get it on a TV. Really excellent to be able to watch on demand exercises. You don't have to worry about DVDs and stuff. I do highly recommend their yoga package, which I've been using just for flexibility and the stretching came in super handy while traveling with my foot problem. Give it a try. My listeners are going to get a free trial membership when you text Eric to 303030. You're going to get full access to the entire platform for free. All the workouts and nutrition information free. All you've got to do is text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 303030. Go do it right now. Text Eric to 303030. And thank you to Beachbody On Demand for sponsoring the show. It is 25 after the hour. Can we just talk for one minute about this latest craze that supposedly is happening? This kid snorting condoms through their nose and then spitting them out through their mouth. I actually don't believe this is a big thing. 
like the Tide Pod Challenge. You know, I, I was having this conversation about the Tide Pod Challenge a couple of weeks ago with, with a buddy who said, oh, they, they know someone whose kid did this. Well, then you start probing and he, the, their friend, no, it was a friend of the friend. It wasn't actually their kid. And then, and then it was a friend. No one actually knew the person who did it. It just it kind of it, it took over that someone. Had, I don't believe that this is as, as big a thing as it is. Here's what I think happens. And again, this is this is all theory on my part, but I've been around the block enough to to presume these things that the media gets gets possessed with this idea. It goes viral. It's drummed up in some corner of the Internet. Some reporter catches wind of it, runs the story that this is a real thing. Other reporters then in the herd mentality all say, oh, this is a real thing. And then it is through the media coverage that teens actually do say, oh, other kids are doing this. I'm going to do this. But no kids have actually done it first before the media coverage. Or if they have, it's only a couple of them. The media incentivizes this coverage. The media incentivizes the act. I mean, honestly, I did not, I, I had not heard of a single kid in the metro Atlanta area who tried the Tide Pod Challenge until after it got maximum exposure all over the media that this is happening around the country. And I don't think it was. They were all showing the same handful of idiots who had done it. And it wasn't like the others had dropped dead. There just weren't any others. And the same thing's going on with this snoring gun. They're all showing the, the, the same kids doing it. And it's all like one kid. I just do not listen. I think millennials and younger people are tend to be stupid because they're young. Their brains are full of mush. That's why your kid's not salt and light. You, you, you got to make them salt and light before you send them out into the world. There, You just can't go out of the world and, and say, say, be a good kid. No, you got to teach them. You got to teach them not to be an idiot. But I think that, that kids do have enough self-awareness that they're not that stupid. I mean, don't give them the right to vote. vote. Don't, don't let them make policy on guns. But by God, I just don't think there are a mass number of kids out there snorting and swallowing condoms or, or eating Tide Pods. It's just media hype. It is the media herd. It's the same thing going back to the Sinclair broadcasting thing. The media is outraged by this, but how often does the media come up with these talking points to begin with? Remember Gravitas? Go all the way back to Dick Cheney. When George W. Bush picked Dick Cheney to be his vice president, all the media, oh, he has Gravitas on every station. You hear this over and over and over and over. Or last year. In September and October, oh, Donald Trump, he can't be president. You know, there's that poll out this past week showing that 60% of the public thinks there's no way on God's good earth Donald Trump is going to get reelected in, in 2020, which tells me he's going to be president for eight years. Because all the people, myself included, in, in 2016, bought the polling that, that there's no way he was going to win. Well, at the state level, the polling was different. Same thing's going to happen in 2020. This herd mentality of the media has them drumming up these, these scare scenarios about teenagers. It's not really happening. And if it is, well, natural selection, I guess. This weather needs to just hurry up and figure out whether it wants to be winter or spring. My wife showed me something on the internet the other day uh, that said um, seasons in the south, winter, spring, late winter, early spring, winter, late spring, late winter, summer, winter, summer, summer, winter, fall, winter, spring, summer, winter, winter, something like that. Anyway, you get the point. It can't make up its mind. Now. Let's talk about local control. The legislature is gone. I got to tell you, the number of people who were very upset with me last week for not being here for the final day of the session. I'm sorry. Uh, family first. Uh, last week was our kids spring break and we went to Hilton Head for the week. And I'm sorry I couldn't help you uh, with your piece of legislation and being on radio to talk about it. Uh, I was with my kids on vacation. Far more important. But I hope the governor vetoes the legislation that passed out of the legislature that um, would prohibit Sandy Springs, Roswell, Dunwoody, and the like from requiring steel frame buildings if they're going to be above three stories. The legislature passed a piece of legislation that uh, prohibits these local governments from requiring steel frame buildings. I think actually it's above two stories. Uh, if they're three or four stories, they can be wood frame. The reason that these cities 
don't do wood frame structures is because they're a bigger fire hazard. And this makes sense if you think about it. A wood frame structure will burn. A steel frame structure, it can burn. Um, but it will. the fire tends to move far more slowly than if everything being wood. And fires tend to be less likely. They tend to be more structurally sound in the long term. And if you're in Dunwoody or Roswell or Sandy Springs or Metro Atlanta, and it's rush hour, and a fire breaks out at your apartment complex, do you want to be in a steel frame building or a wood frame building when it takes the fire department time through traffic to get to your building where the fire doubles in size every minute in a wood frame structure? That's why these cities have required steel frames. It makes sense. It may not make sense in Pine Mountain, Georgia. It may not make sense in, I don't know, pick your small town, Georgia, Cairo, Georgia, Vienna, Unadilla, uh, Macon, uh, Irwinton. It may not make sense there, but it makes sense in those areas. In, in the same way we saw this legislation, I believe it failed, uh, the puppy mill legislation that would prohibit local governments from uh, regulating puppy mills. There were a number of acts by state legislators, Republicans, to curtail local control. And I got to tell you, the more I see the culture war running amok in this country, the more I am a big believer in the idea that local control will solve a lot of what ails us. Not all. It's not perfect. There are still problems. But if you don't want to live in a place that requires steel frame structures, don't. If you don't want to do business in such a place, don't. But trying to require them to do so, and the reason this is done, so that you understand this, so you paint the, get the full, full picture of it, no one's denying this, it is not in dispute by anyone, lobbyists for the lumber industry wanted this legislation. They felt like they were being unfairly targeted by cities, and so they wanted this legislation to require that wood frames be used instead of steel frames. Never mind the concerns of these cities for their citizens. It was all about the money. And by the way, just so you know, for full perspective here, the lumber that is used is mostly imported from Canada for these buildings. It's not actually lumber that's um, harvested in Georgia. It comes from Canada. So it wouldn't really help them anyway. It was more a symbolic act. And I think it's ridiculous. I think we got to start having local control. This idea that local governments can't regulate puppy mills This idea that local governments can't, for the safety of its citizens, mandate steel frame buildings based on fire fire patterns in the past and in history, it's ridiculous. These are Republican legislators. They should start acting like it, and they're not. So I hope the governor vetoes uh, this particular piece of legislation that would require wood frame structures in metropolitan areas. Let the local governments decide. Republicans should not be scared of local control. They should be using it to their advantage against liberals, particularly as the culture war heats up. Another story out there, the Laura Ingram situation with Fox. Um, I'm not a big Laura Ingram fan. Uh, You know, so Bill Maher at HBO, not a big fan of his comedy, not a big fan of his politics. I find it striking, though, and uh, a reflection of, of whether or not you, you think his public persona is, is good or not, uh, that behind the scenes, the average tenure of a person working for him is 15 years. Yeah, let me say that again. The average tenure of a person working for Bill Maher at HBO is 15 years. Now, you, you can despise the guy. I don't care. But behind the scenes, that tends to speak volumes about the 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 good person you're dealing with behind the scenes. There are probably 2 billion people who have served as radio producers for Lori Ingram in the past couple of years. She can't keep people working for her. She is not a pleasant person to work for on her radio show and from what I hear from people at Fox on her TV show. She's her public persona is is she's with you, she's kind, but behind the scenes, I I just routinely run into people who work for her for 6 months and and couldn't put up with it. Uh, good conservatives, many of the major conservative organizations in Washington are are staffed by people who used to work for Laura Ingram for two weeks and had enough. Um, but this whole idea that she needs to be driven off the air because uh, she d- wanted to highlight the fact that David Hogg couldn't get into colleges, I, I don't think it's relevant. I wouldn't have done it, but who cares? He is a bully. David Hogg is a bully. 
He is using his clout in the media to demand boycotts of businesses that don't give him his way. He's using his clout in the media to shame people like Laura Ingram and shut her down and, and get her taken off the air. He is doing what the media routinely attacks Donald Trump for doing. And by the way, David Hogg turns out to be Donald Trump's best friend. Rasmussen has the president at 50% approval rating. Now, Rasmussen tends to be off in, in its margins. It, it's not the most reliable poll, but it certainly gets the trends right that the president's popularity is going up. And I think you can attribute about 90% of the president's increase in popularity these days to David Hogg. When people who aren't particularly keen on the president see this kid being able to go on TV, say all sorts of awful things about his political opponents and and try to drive people off the air and organize boycotts of businesses because he disagrees with them on guns. Uh, People who they're not necessarily enamored with the president say, you know what, I'd rather be with him than these people. The gun control zealots right now are President Trump's best friend and David Hogg is at the forefront of the gun control zealots. They are scaring people into supporting Donald Trump. They are going to give this man another term, and he will deserve it with their tactics. And this trying to drive Laura Ingram off the air is just ridiculous. These people, you know, they, they always talk about the, the president as a fascist. You know what the fascists did in Italy? They said corporations could stay in business as long as they towed a particular partisan line. The corporations had to support one viewpoint. That's what you're seeing on the left. If your corporation does business with, with gun manufacturers, if your bank does, we got to shut them down. If your business sells guns, we got to shut them down. If your business advertises on Laura Ingram, we got to shut them down. The left's been so worried about fascism coming from the president, they've completely ignored the rise of fascism within their own ranks. It is 55 after the hour. So there have been knife attacks in london it is now has a worse crime rate than new york city for the first time ever apparently worse crime rate than new york city in london and of course you have piers morgan calling for the regulation of knives online um perhaps there are other things they might want to regulate in london like for example Um, there is a situation today where a, a laborer that is a left-wing member of parliament is upset, uh, that someone noted the labor party is trying to coddle London Muslims and make the case that the conservatives are cracking down on crime and making it a, a, an issue of Muslim violence. And this labor minister of parliament reached out to the police via Twitter to file a complaint that this was hate speech and this person needed to be arrested. Someone has gone to jail in London for telling uh, an off-color racial joke. Um, They do not have the First Amendment in Great Britain. It's another reminder of why we are a better country uh, because of our freedoms, including our right to keep and bear arms, which makes us a better country. Oh, and by the way, did you know that we actually don't have the worst of gun violence in the world. We'll talk about this tomorrow. New research out. We, we don't, in the Western world, have the worst gun violence. That's just what the media wants you to believe. <laughs> 